Okay, so thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Um, so the, the speed actually trade-off is something we, we, we encounter a lot in HCI. And often when you try to evaluate the quality of an interaction, we measure its speed and accuracy, right? And we want this to be as high as possible. And if we want to increase the, the, the speed and accuracy, we end up uh, at a limit above which if we try to increase accuracy, we should decrease the speed and vice versa. And this is what's called the speed accuracy trade-off. And in this talk, I'm interested about the speed accuracy trade-off in pointing movements. And now this has famously been studied by Fitz. Um, and so what he did was he made participants sit in front of a, of a board with two targets that have a certain size W, and he made them repeatedly point back and forth between them. And now Fitz uh, manipulated accuracy by modifying the values of D and W, um, which is summarized by the index of difficulty. So ID is the log of one plus the ratio D over W. Um, and what he found was that the movement time uh, was actually predicted by this uh, index of difficulty, and he found a linear relationship between movement time and index of difficulty. Now, what's important for us in HCI is that the parameters A and B of this linear relationship, they vary according to the participant and to the device. So what, if we estimate these values for A and B, then we can actually evaluate the performance of a device or a user. And if we assume values for A and B, so we use old values from existing experiments, for example, we can actually predict the movement time for a pointing task or as part of a more complex interaction. So FITSAW is widely used in HCI. I guess all of you have probably heard of it. But still, it suffers from many issues. And in this presentation, I've selected three problems. So the first problem is the problem of many different formulations. And now the question is, how many different formulations can you think of? And personally, I know about 15, probably more. Um, now, the second problem is that sometimes participants miss the target. Um, so typically what we do in HCI is we look at the actual uh, uh, distribution of endpoints, which are all the, all the black bullet points. We measure their standard deviation, and then we multiply this by a constant factor. And this is our effective width, WE, and we, we replace the width by this effective width. Now, this was a solution first uh, given by Crossman in experimental psychology, and then it was popularized by McKenzie in HCI. And in the paper, we, we have a critique of this solution. So I refer you to the paper. It's a bit too long for this talk. And what actually uh, this, this issue with target misses points to is that Fitz's experiment actually fails to manipulate accuracy in an accurate way because of the target misses. The third problem is, is a problem which I call problem of regression. So this is a empirical data that you see all the time in Fitz's law. So on the y-axis, you have movement time. And on the x-axis, you have the index of difficulty. And here, each blue dot is, a, is the outcome of a single movement. And now, according to Fitz's law, you would expect that all these blue dots align uh, quite nicely onto a straight line. And you see it's actually not really the case. And then we, actually, we can actually compute the best straight line possible for these points which is the orange uh, line here. And you see the R squared value is quite low. It's, it's much too low for a typical FITS uh, task for what we see in HCI. Because what we actually do in HCI usually is we consider uh, the average uh, movement time per condition. So you can see here the, the, the blue scatter, scatter plot is the same as previously, except here I've represented, I've represented orange diamonds, which are the average movement time per condition. And then these align quite nicely, actually, and if you compute the, the best straight line through this, you find typical values of, of R squared that you find, find in uh, HCI, except the, the, the parameters of the line are actually more or less the same as before. Now, I know some of you will tell me that this is normal. We're just uh, reducing the noise that we have in the data by averaging the measures. But then the question is, what do you do with data like this? So this is data from a field study, which is very high variability. And of course, we can compute uh, linear regression. And this will give us the orange line that sits kind of in the middle. And you can see, obviously, it's what, what can we do with this information? It's hard to interpret. So the goal of this work is to provide a theoretical framework for the speed actually trade-off that's simple but rigorous and not completely driven by empirical considerations. And hopefully, it will solve problems I just showed. And now what we're going to use is information theory. Uh, for several reasons. It was first because Fitz's law was actually originally uh, conceived as an analogy with the Shannon's capacity formula. 
And because the channel capacity theorem can actually be interpreted as a speed accuracy trade-off. So let's jump right into the one, the only result I'm going to present today of information theory, which is the capacity of the Gaussian channel. So first of all, first of all what's the channel? So a channel is, is just a pipe. It has an input, X, and an output, Y. Uh, and in the case, this particular case of the Gaussian channel, the model is that the output is a noisy observation of the input. So you see Y is the sum of X, the input, plus some Gaussian sample. And now we have a clever way of having a mathematical formula for the in transmitted information is the, in this pipe, in information theory, which is called I. And what we try to do is we try to maximize this transmitted information. And this maximum transmitted information is called the capacity C. And this maximum, you find it over all possible input distribution. So you look for all the axes that maximize this transmitted information. And in the case of the Gaussian channel, the input that maximizes this is also an is also the Gaussian distribution with variance P. Now, if you look at the famous Shannon's theorem 17, it's just an evaluation of the C in the case of the Gaussian channel. And so you see it's simply the, the bandwidth times log of one plus P over N, where P is the power of the input and N is the power of the noise. And this theorem expresses a trade-off between time through the bandwidth parameter and bits. Now, Fitz directly applied this formula, and he said, well, in case of human movements, my signal is the average movement, and the noise is just the moving variability. And then he said, because bandwidth is expressed in hertz, which is, with the units are one over a time, he simply identified bandwidth to one over a time, and if you put all of this into Shannon's capacity formula, you actually find Fitz's first uh, formula in 1954, uh, and then he added later an intercept uh, for be better data fitting. So if we look, take a step back, the, there are some questions that emerge. So first of all, why do we identify bandwidth with one over MT? It's not that simple. And why would you equate a variance, which is supposed to be proportional or at least related to the square of the input, to the amplitude, which is, would be related to the input itself? And what's the channel model of the aiming task and what's a, what are the inputs and outputs? And by this we mean basically what's the link between Shannon's capacity formula and aiming? Because to us it's, it's hard to draw a link just from, from, from this. So our model actually answers these questions. So this is the name of the model, so a formal information theoretic transmission scheme. Um, and so the, the first abstract model is, is, is very simple, so there's a the user has the intention of, of aiming it towards the target, and this intention is mapped into a signal that's sent over a noisy channel to the muscles which perform movement. And have we seen be just before, everything in this work relies on the channel model. So what we're going to do is we're going to integrate the task constraints in the channel model. Okay, so let's do this. So if we look at the task, well, when we have to hit a target, what we're going to do is we're going to aim at the center of the target and then we allow a variability that's the size of the target. So this gives the first constraint on noise. And then the fact that the targets are separated by distance D gives a second constraint on the input. And then if we take these two constraints together, this gives a first, third, constraint, third constraint on the output. So now we have assumed basically that the noise was bounded, but we still have to choose a, a distribution for noise and this is not something that's easy. So what we do is we, we use something that's, that's used uh, in physics, which is called the principle of maximum entropy, which is basically says that if you don't know how to choose a distribution, your best bet is to go with the one that maximizes the entropy. So in our case, this is the uniform distribution. So we assume, so this is a, a recap of the, of the channel model, so with all the bounds and the uniform distributed noise. And so in the paper, we, we actually show how you can compute the capacity of this channel. So we, we uh, express the transmitted information and then look for the, the best input. And we show that the capacity is actually log of one plus D over W, which is exactly the idea as proposed by McKenzie in 99. And what's interesting is if we look at the input that actually reaches the capacity, it's the discrete uniform input. And I've represented it just here. So the, the input space are all the, are the set of black bullet points. So it's as if you see the entire available space uh, was filled up with targets of size W, 
And when you actually aim towards the target, you actually choose the right target. And so we sum up this in the paper with a catchphrase, which is that aiming is actually choosing. So this is an interpretation. Um, so I know some of you will have maybe a tough time accepting the uniform noise uh, assumption. But the interesting thing here is that if we look at what the un uniform noise was given by the maximum entropy principle, so in our case, it's actually the worst noise, right? So this capacity is actually a lower bound. And now the question is, suppose the noise is not uniform, but for example, Gaussian, which most of you will agree is likely, what is the error that we actually make by assuming this capacity with uniform noise? And now in the paper, we actually show that this difference is at most 0.2 bits. So it's actually quite small. Uh, you can find more, more details about this in the paper. So now we presented a model for errorless tasks with uniform noise, and then we show how it can be generalized to any arbitrary noise, and I just show you an evaluation with the Gaussian noise. And so what about target misses? So that's what I'm addressing now. So sometimes participants miss the target, as, as I've said. And in the paper, to talk about misses, we distinguish errors from erasures. And what we mean by errors, um, if you look at how, error, how the correction is computed, it takes into account the standard deviation. And standard deviation basically considers the distance from each endpoint to the target center. So within this definition, all movements involve metrical errors. So this is what we mean by errors. It's just that their amplitude varies. Now, on the other hand, if we look at a GUI, what matters is really whether or not the click falls inside the intended area. So here, if I want to click on sponsors, I can click anywhere inside this uh, light gray orange box. And it doesn't matter where the clicks takes place. And this dichotomous hit or miss notion corresponds to the notion of erasures. So in the paper, we treat the mistakes as erasures and we show that the, the calculation of the capacity is actually very simple. And it's simply one minus epsilon, so which is actually the success rate, times the ID. And you see that the, the ID corresponds to the accuracy as prescribed by W, and the success rate is just a correction for the misses. If we compare the two corrections, so the crossman mckenzie correction and the one that comes from a erasure model, an important difference is that the crossman mckenzie correction assumes the a Gaussian distribution for the errors, whereas in our case, there is no such uh, assumption. So actually, we have a non-parametric uh, formulation here. Another nice thing is that if you look at the condition when, for null error rates, the crossman mckenzie correction is actually undefined. And in our case, it simply reduces to the index of difficulty. So this is simply interpreted as the index of difficulty is, the, is the, the transmitted information when there are no errors. So it's a very simple interpretation. So this is uh, basically I presented a complete model for movement time and fits tasks. But we never actually asked ourselves which movement time are we talking about. Because if we think about what channel capacity gives us, it should give us a minimum movement time because the channel capacity is expressed as a maximum. But what we do in HCI usually is what we ask uh, participants to work as rapidly as possible, but then we trust them to, to actually do it, and then we compute the average time. So this is something that's kind of like an average minimum time. And so what we argue in the paper um, is that we, there's a lot to be gained if we separate these two metrics into an average time metrics, which would be given by the linear regression, as usual, and the minimum time metric, which would correspond to the information theoretic interpretation of Fitts law. And to show you an example of how this looks like, so this is a data set from a pointing field study. And so you see that the, the orange line is the one uh, that you get from linear regression. It kind of sits in the middle. Um, and the minimum time metric is given by the black line. And so you see this gives a lot more information. You can actually compare two different metrics, and this gives a lot more useful information than just the orange line that sits in the middle. Um, so to conclude, um, our model uh, links the index of difficulty to a channel capacity where everything is defined and interpreted. Um, now, on the downside, it's kind of a black, black box model for endpoints. It's only concerned with movement time. It's not concerned about the full trajectories. It's not really based on any empirical findings about the, the nervous system. And it's based on abstract information theory. We don't take feedback into account. Now, a third problem is that we never actually tell you in the paper how to compute the minimum time regression. 
Um, so actually this, this is what's work done in 2016, 2017, and it was published in 2018, so you can find the references here. And since then we've actually made a lot of progress. Um, so we have come up with a new scheme which we call FITS2, which is basically a scheme for full trajectories with feedback control. Uh, so you can find uh, most of it in a preprint uh, or inside my thesis, which is uh, online since December. Uh, and then we also provided recently a, a new regression technique, uh, which is a formal method to, to uh, determine this minimum time metric. So again, I refer you to a preprint for this. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will be taking questions. If time for one quick question. I have a question for you. Would you advise from now on if you want to characterize new input devices and you want to give like an index of difficulty or a performance measure, are you actually specifying that you should not only compute minimum time but also average time? Do, should we actually give two measures? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be gained, actually, by separating these two measures. And the difference uh, between those two might give you interesting results. For example, if, if I did this on a control, if I've shown you the same thing on a control study, the average time metric and the minimum time metric would be almost identical. Uh, in a field study, they are very far apart. And actually, just computing the two and, and looking at the difference can actually give you an idea of how much the participants actually invested their effort. Uh, during the experiment. Because sometimes we know participants, they, they get bored, especially in experiments like FITS task. Uh, and this actually, if you, if you notice that the two lines are actually quite close, it can give you some assurance that the participants were actually uh, engaged in the task or things like this. So this is one idea. Uh, of course, there are probably uh, other things that can be uh, envisioned. Yeah, or perhaps that uh, variance among participants or experiments some input devices might just yes, have more variance than exactly. others? Exactly. Some input device might create more variance than others, and this would also be noticeable with this. Okay. Thank you. Very, very challenging. One round of applause. Okay. With this, we conclude this session on behavior monitoring. Time for a break.